It's time for another episode of the How Good Is Your Overwatch League Team Series. It's time we give some attention to the Chengdu Hunters. I've heard some very mixed opinions on what people think of them currently. I've seen some people put them as high as second in Asia, and others who think they're overrated. Let's find out why that is as we explore the Chengdu offseason and give a brief team overview. So in terms of what the Hunters let go of from their Season 3 roster, we would see a variety of coaches and players leave. To start, they would get rid of their entire coaching staff, Ray, Chen, and Gary are all gone. Given how inconsistent Chengdu were last year, this was definitely something that needed to happen. The team showed incompetence in most of the non-wrecking ball compositions they played last year. While the players absolutely share in the blame here, a lot of it does come down to the coaches not being able to teach their guys the fundamentals. Renovations were needed at all levels if the Hunters wanted to leave an ugly season behind them, so it's good to see them getting a fresh start with their coaching. Next up, we'd see Bacon Jack and A-Ting's time come to an end. Again, nothing out of the ordinary here. Both of these players were essentially brought on to be specialists, and they weren't even anything great either. In fact, you'd probably argue they're both bottom tier at their respective positions. These guys are people you'd expect to get rid of. You gotta make room on the roster for the guys you're actually going to get use out of. Two other people to leave the main roster would be Keo and Langsa. Keo, I feel, mostly only got use on the Ana, but generally speaking, he showed little to no progress compared to Season 2. He just feels like a mediocre caliber support player. Molly was the way better player, end of story. He's not someone you'd really envision Chengdu missing in the long term. Keo had two years to prove himself, but was unable to come up with anything that made him worth keeping. Simple as that. Langsa is a bit more interesting though. He certainly had more of an impact than Keo did. He wasn't anything special himself, but he could have done more given how him and Yveltal split playtime. If anything, he came off the bench more often than he started, so he didn't really get enough chances. So I guess the Hunters kind of saw him as expendable. I would have given him another shot personally, but oh well. It's worth noting though that both of these players will be playing for Chengdu's Academy roster which means theoretically they could one day get promoted back to the main roster in some way, shape, or form if they improve enough. Chengdu must have at least some interest in them you'd have to assume, but of course, you should not be getting your hopes up too much if you're a big time Keo or Langsa fan. The final departure of the Chengdu offseason would be Molly, who they traded to the Shanghai Dragons. Regardless of the new talent they're getting here, it feels questionable to remove someone with so much potential. He was easily one of their best players last year, no question. I guess he no longer fits the system, or maybe he wasn't happy there anymore? Regardless, it's tough to see somebody with that much talent leave the roster, because he could have been a big help in formulating a turnaround year. So there you have it. Those are the players and coaches no longer on Chengdu. Before getting into the additions though, I thought I'd start by mentioning that both Yveltal and Late Young are now on two-way contracts. They're still on the roster, yes, but they'll mostly be playing for the Chengdu Academy team, Team Chaser, alongside Kyo and Langsa. Both of these guys have their specialties that make them worth playing at certain times though, so I'm assuming they're still going to have a use on Chengdu. Yveltal, he's still a proficient Mercy player at the end of the day, and Late Young is a better option than Elsa when Azaria is needed. The fact that they both have previous experience with some of these Chengdu teammates and coaches makes me feel even better about the situation. I like this a lot, and if they really start to play well, they can always be promoted to full-time players. Good strategy by Chengdu here. Now we can explore the acquisitions. The first thing this team made sure to do as their offseason began was bring back RUI to once again be the head coach of this team. It's good to see him back. He's a strict coach with high expectations, but he's good at his job. Probably the most successful coach from the Chinese scene. Not only did he help this particular franchise make the play-ins a few years ago, but he also won a lot of games under miraculous youngsters. Let's not forget the back-to-back -back silver medals coaching Team China in the World Cup either. This man knows what he's doing. He's a trustworthy leader, and now will have more firepower than ever, so Chengdu have a serious chance to produce their best results ever under his guidance. Joining RUI as assistants are Creed and Yauxi. Both are very qualified to be a part of this team, I feel. Both are former players with at least one noteworthy achievement going for them as a coach. Creed was part of the 2019 Shanghai Dragons and the 2020 Guangzhou Charge. He also happened to be on the coaching staff for China during the 2019 World Cup, which means that he actually already has prior experience working with RUI. All of that combined makes me feel this was a match made in heaven. Yaoxi, on the other hand, well, he's a bit less qualified. His crowning achievement as a coach was helping Flag Gaming getting the upset over Team CC in the most recent season of Chinese Contenders, but that's still pretty good considering that team has pretty much been dominating everyone in their path the last year or so. Not even the Korean Contenders teams can stand up to them. 
so he might be a pretty good assistant as well. Generally speaking, I'm pretty excited about this coaching staff. In my opinion, it's looking like the best they've ever had. Well, at least on paper, because Chengdu are historically a weird team, so it might be a challenge no matter what. So now for the players. The Hunters added five new players this offseason. The first two guys to be announced were Jimmy and Kaneki. Two very interesting DPS prospects here. Jimmy feels like he could be a dominant hitscan prospect. Don't be deceived by him going from team to team so often throughout his history. He knows how to hit some big time shots, believe me. He could be a serious bright spot on this year's Chengdu team. He'll provide some needed explosiveness, and it could be something truly special. He was a fantastic prospect to scout out. He could give a lot of enemy hitscan players a real challenge. So now for Kaneki. He's on this team as a flex. This guy's hero pool could really help balance out the holes left behind Jinmu and everybody else for that matter. The big thing that he brings to the table here in my opinion is a good Sombra. Watching Jinmu struggle on her last year was a nightmare. Enforcing leave onto her was not the best thing either. Even though he was good at her, you'd want him on more mechanically demanding heroes. Kaneki potentially solves this issue plus a few other coverage options. Chengdu's DPS line has a very well-rounded feel to it now where everybody has their own comfort picks. Next up, Chengdu addressed their hole at main support with the addition of Nisha, formerly known as Illusion, I believe. As a member of Billy Billy Gaming and the one winner, his teams consistently finished top three or better in Chinese contenders throughout the last few years. He has some good experience under his belt. I can't say anything for certain about his mercy, but I could see him being a better option than Yvelto on like Brigitta and maybe Lucio. He has a good playmaker mentality to him. I have high hopes for him, but at the same time, it's kind of shifted more into cautious optimism these last few months or so. Many people within the community have made it clear to me that I have initially overrated him a little bit. He was by no means the best option on the market, so that could hinder Chengdu's potential. I'm going to give him a fair chance before making any official judgments, of course, but there are some slight worries going on. Capping off the Chengdu offseason, they acquired Gaga in 1987 out of Team CC. Now these are the premier players we really have to keep an eye on. They're coming from our arguably the best contenders team in the world. They are expected to bring some big time contributions. They are the rookies who will have the most pressure on them to perform. The good news though is that these two are very much prepared for this type of challenge thanks to their talents. Gaga is literally one of the best main tanks coming out of contenders. The only person I'd put ahead of him for sure is Mag. This guy has quite the high ceiling. He's shown prowess on every main tank character in the game, and don't even get me started on his wrecking ball. It could be one of the best in the league right from day one. Based off the gameplay I have seen of this guy, he does not have a lot of exploitable weaknesses. He is a very well-rounded player who usually asserts dominance over his enemies with ease. Gaga gives the Hunters exactly what they needed. He provides them with a stable main tank who can be effective on more than just Wrecking Ball. No offense to A-Monk, but Gaga is simply the better option. He's a better Rhyne, a much better Orisa, and he can actually play Winston. Not to mention that his Wrecking Ball is basically better in most people's eyes. The Orisa winston thing is the thing I'm the most excited about, though. They can properly play Dive and Bunker now. Gaga is the biggest tank prospect to come out of China since Gushui, and he could absolutely be better if everything goes the way he needs it to. Alright, but what about Faraway 1987? Well, he impressed quite a bit as well. He's a pretty solid Zen and Ana player. He's got good mechanics and decent decision making, although it could use a little bit of work. He might get even better under this Chengdu coaching staff though. I can't guarantee he's going to be as good as somebody like Molly was, but he certainly does have what it takes. Chengdu don't have any other flex supports on the roster currently, so he definitely has more chances to shine. That much is certain. He has some great challenges ahead of him though. He's never had to play against flex supports quite like this. Asia only has seven other teams, so he'll be going up against the likes of Alarm, Jonek, and Izayaki on a regular basis. He's got to continue to show that same prowess from contenders, or his team is going to be in big trouble. At least if Gaga were to struggle, he does have a backup on hand, but 1987 doesn't really have that luxury currently. It's do or die. He's got to show up. And that is your 2021 Chengdu Hunters. Not too bad. They made some noticeable improvements with their coaching, at main tank, and at DPS. We're talking potential groundbreaking changes that could help this team be a bit more consistent and competitive compared to previous years. I'm very happy with their decision making progress for the most part, and that is why I'm giving the Hunters a B plus as their offseason grade. Adding in high potential pieces at multiple positions leaves a very satisfying feeling. Not only did they grab future stars in the making, but they have much better hero coverage in some of the places which really hurt them last year. This roster feels set to have a more competitive edge. They're well coached with a high mechanical ceiling, but the thing is, the roster is still not what you'd call fully optimized. 
I've mentioned it with other teams already in this series, but having two flex supports on the roster is becoming more of a norm these days. It's good to have another one on hand in case the meta suddenly turns towards Baptiste Zen. Nisha might not be the most ideal option on a character like Baptiste. It's not necessarily problematic given that most teams in Asia only have one flex support, but they're kind of missing out on an opportunity to gain an advantage over their opponents. Given how competitive this region is set to be, they could use all the help they can get. My other issue comes with not addressing off tank. Elsa still being the primary option does not inspire a ton of confidence. He's never been insane to begin with, but season 3 saw a down year out of him. Again, with Asia being as good as it is, average play is just not going to cut it. He probably could be slightly above average at best I would say. Even under RUI, he really wasn't anything that amazing back in the day. It really sucks that they weren't able to get League out of Team CC. It would have been massive. Elsa could be a potential weakness that Chengdu are going to have to try and hide at times. Could he maybe improve as time goes on? Yeah, sure. But it might not be enough no matter what. I don't feel super confident in his abilities on D.Va and Sigma these days. How many players from APAC could he realistically outplay? It doesn't feel like that many if you ask me. Besides those two things though, it was a pretty solid offseason for the Hunters. They made quite a few positive changes and I'm very proud of them for that. To give a brief preview of my expectations now, I genuinely see them competing with most of their competition on a regular basis. They'd have to really throw and play like their old selves if this were not to be the case. The versatility of DPS and the general star power they're rocking with puts them in a prime position to be an absolute nightmare for their competition, and if Wrecking Ball remains the meta like he currently is, that's only going to put them in an even better position. They were already an elite ball team to begin with, but now they're adding even more pieces who dominate in it thanks to Gaga in 1987. Hopefully that Team CC winning culture rubs off on the rest of the roster. I am somewhat content with this team, so I realistically see them finishing anywhere from 11th through 8th place in the overall standings. As much as I think they have the potential to be really good, there are some possible problems that could lead to some inconsistency issues. Like I already said before, their support situation is not the best. I like 1987, and I'm happy Yveltal is still here, but Nisha is a little risky. There's reason to feel optimistic, but also nervous thanks to the overwhelming competition. I think he does have what it takes to be like a middle of the pack main support in APAC, but it's really going to depend on some of the other young main supports he's going up against, like Mondu, Friday, and whoever the Valiant choose to pick up. The no guarantee factor on a player who is not getting seriously hyped up means there's a chance that things could go seriously wrong. And like I already said, I worry about how he does in a double flex support composition. I just don't know how trustworthy he is on Baptiste. The Hunters kind of have to hope that the meta can stay where it is for a while so they can pile on the wins early and put themselves in a decent position come playoff time. Not only that, but as mentioned previously, I do have some concerns over Elsa. He genuinely might be the worst starting off tank in APAC, and I'm dead serious about that. Unless he improves drastically, he might be problematic not just individually, but for this team in general. If he underperforms, that might seriously affect somebody like Gaga. Think about it. The guy might be really good, but he needs a trustworthy off-tank partner. That's how it goes for all main tanks, you know? He was spoiled by the elite play of League, so that might greatly hinder what he can do knowing that there's a big-time downgrade in place. Tank partner issues could hold him back. There's only so much one guy can do on his own. I pray that Elsa can get whipped into shape, or it might mean the difference between going to the playoffs and going home. There's also some slight concerns about Chengdu being Chengdu, I would say. It might sound ridiculous, but they might be that same wacky and inconsistent team no matter what moves they make. I feel like a complete overhaul might be the only way to get rid of something like that. It's just a minor thing because I really do like their additions, but I thought I'd mention it since history does like to repeat itself with certain franchises in any sport out there. I genuinely do have confidence in Chengdu to be above average though. If Nisha and Elsa can play up to the level I hope they can and everybody else plays up to their potential within their respective roles, then Chengdu are going to be dangerous. If I'm a Chengdu fan, I'm feeling pretty hyped, because there's reason to believe this might be the most enjoyable season to spend supporting them. There's a lot of promise going on. Let's see if they can finally escape the Chengdu zone. And with that said, that is going to wrap up another off-season recap and team preview. So now I turn it over to you guys. What are your thoughts on the Chengdu Hunters? Do you think they'll finally be a consistent team? Let me know down in the comments section. If you enjoyed this video, it would mean so much if you could give it a like and subscribe if you don't want to miss out on the next episode of the series. And as always, thank you all for watching. I really appreciate your support. And until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.